uh, is, is more kind of, if you think if this um, abstract is more kind of practice changing, um, then you need probably to look uh, deeply into, into this trial and, and read um, uh, between the lines. So. So this will be the outline of my lecture today. First, I will try to, to do more kind of an overview on the current standard of care for hormone positive, um, HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Then I will um, uh, highlight uh, the recent data that we have at ASK with this year and whether this data is um, changing the current standard or not. And finally, I will conclude with a few take home messages. So um, in order to target HER2 in metastatic uh, setting, uh, we do have many, many options. Uh, we do have a number of uh, monoclonal antibodies such as uh, Trasdo, uh, Pertuzumab, uh, plus other um, newer one. Uh, we do also have a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor such as lapatinib, uh, niratinib, and, and, and lastly, tocatinib. Uh, we also have um, the antibody drug conjugate, uh, such as the TDM1, and also we have also other um, uh, newer versions. So um, some of those monoclonal antibody have uh, more kind of synergetic effect, and, and this has been seen um, with this important uh, trial. Uh, this trial, one of the um, trial that have changed, uh, in fact, the way we treat metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, this trial was a phase three clinical trial randomized the old standard of care, which is the docetaxel and trastol to the same regimen with addition of uh, bertuzumab. And here you can see quite, quite impressive improvement in, uh, in a BFS with around uh, six months in favor of um, addition of uh, bertuzumab. Uh, in this trial, as you can see here, it's a uh, six cycle of this tax was required, but uh, most patients got uh, around eight cycles. And we don't know really how much chemotherapy duration does matter. But in my practice, I do give between six to eight cycles, uh, depend on the, uh, on the tolerability. So uh, the mature, here is the mature of our survival. And, and we can see here is um, around 16 month absolute uh, benefit in the survival. Uh, and now patient can live uh, for more than five years or five and probably a half year uh, with a 25% um, out of uh, progression at eight years follow up. So it's really important uh, also to highlight that um, the addition of pertuzumab uh, uh, have shown the same benefit or similar benefit in both um, hormone receptor uh, positive as well as uh, the hormone receptor negative. Uh, but the question that we have in our practice is, is this, can, the, can, um, uh, can we replace the chemotherapy with um, endocrine therapy in patient with hormone positive, HER2 positive uh, population? Uh, in the past, we have a number of clinical trials looking at the um, role of endocrine therapy in those patients. Um, uh, but the problem with the design of those trials didn't really answer such question. Here we have three trials comparing the endocrine therapy uh, alone versus endocrine with anti-HER2 with either um, trasto or labatinib. All these trials confirm two facts. The first fact is um, uh, endocrine therapy alone is, is quite poor in, in, in those patient population. And, 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 and the second fact, I would say it's um, the addition of anti-HER2, whether Herceptin or Labatinib, is really impacting on the response rate as well as the BFS. However, these data cannot tell us uh, or can't tell you that if, if those options are better than chemo or um, uh, with anti-HER2 or not, because the design was not made for such. Uh, more data came up also with this regard, especially in the, seat, in the setting of a dual anti-HER2. This was one. Uh, this trial is is the Burton uh, Burton study, which is um, primarily designed to look for the added benefit of dual anti HER2 uh, of Herceptin pertuzumab uh, uh, to Herceptin. In both arm, most patient uh, gut induction uh, chemotherapy. Uh, the trial showed um, 
uh, dual anti-HER2 with um, endocrine therapy is better than a single agent endocrine treatment. And, and, and this also has, um, uh, I believe this has also has been, uh, we, do, we do have a recent data or a recent update for this trial in the um, San Antonio meeting last year. And um, here you can see that um, addition of pertuzumab to Trazdo at uh, only three months to uh, PFS uh, and only three months to overall survival. Uh, but as, as you can see here, the, the trial design still didn't answer if this endocrine therapy is as good or better than chemotherapy with anti-HER2. And uh, when you do cross um, trial comparison with Cleopatra, uh, those results uh, are not really so impressive as um, uh, the numbers that we have with Cleopatra. Uh, but I would say it's, uh, this might be an option or reasonable option for those who might not be candidate or for chemotherapy or decline chemotherapy as well. So what do we have at ASCO uh, uh, 2021 this year? This was the SYSUCC002 uh, SY trial. Uh, this trial, I will say, is um, the first trial that addressed the concept of a chemo versus um, endocrine-based uh, um, uh, anti-HER2 regimen. It is um, kind of an Asian uh, trial. Those patients, um, the HER2 positive or mom positive represent around 10% of all metastatic breast cancer and with a background of endocrine uh, tolerability and the lack of head-to-head -head comparison of endocrine versus chemo-based anti-HER2, this trial was um, initiated. So this was a phase three clinical trials. Um, uh, uh, metastatic breast cancer, hormone positive, HER2 positive, or triple positive. Uh, patient was randomized to either endocrine with anti-HER2 or chemotherapy with anti-HER2 with a primary endpoint of PFS and the secondary endpoint was an overall survival. My comment here on, on, on the design is that first, um, they have not included pertuzumab to Trasto uh, in any of those arms. Uh, also, when you look at the control arm, it's not the standard of chemotherapy or the Cleopatra protocol. Uh, here we can see mixed of chemotherapy, including um, texane, uh, capecitabine, as well as uh, venerobine. Here also more than 12 months disease-free interval was mandated to be included in, in this trial. So um, around 392 patients were planned to be enrolled from September 2013 to 2019. And uh, with the classical inclusion criteria of metastatic uh, breast cancer, HER2 positive, hormone positive, uh, but with the regard of ER and BR, they include the 10% um, uh, or more. And uh, as described also, the disease-free interval have to be more than uh, 12 months to be included in this trial. Those patients was nicely uh, to, to, uh, distributed between both arm of chemotherapy or endocrine therapy-based um, anti-HER2. And the patient characteristic as in this Table, the median age was around 50, 30% was premenopausal, around 60% have also um, uh, fistral involvement, and a third of those already have at least uh, two um, sites was, was involved. Short and long disease-free interval was looked at, and around 40% have a longer disease-free interval of more than uh, two years. Uh, majority of those patients are um, recurrent disease and uh, had a prior therapy with only one third um, uh, were kind of um, de novo metastatic. Uh, when you look at the, here, when you look at the PFS, uh, which is the primary endpoint, both are look comparable with no significant difference between both arms. The same thing we have seen also with regard to overall survival, there was no difference from statistical point of view. So um, one important finding in this trial that also worth um, highlighting is the BFS benefit, uh, which somehow seems to be uh, correlated 
associated with the disease uh, free interval. Uh, for the those um, uh, with a shorter disease-free interval of less than two years, uh, chemotherapy looks better. While those with a longer endocrine, with a longer endocrine, also might be also um, a reasonable option for those patients as well. So definitely, there is no surprise when it comes to toxicity. Endocrine-based um, uh, therapy, it's it's uh, definitely is more tolerable. Uh, than chemo-based uh, therapy. And this also was seen in, in this trial. Uh, the conclusion of the author or presenter at, at the ASCO was um, uh, trastuzumab plus endocrine therapy is not inferior to chemotherapy-based uh, anti-HER2. So, but my uh, personal comment on, on this, um, uh, yes, definitely the, from tolerability point of view, uh, endocrine-based therapy is, is quite a reasonable choice. And, and this might be considered, uh, I would say, for a selected patient who might, be, who might not be candidate for um, uh, chemotherapy. But in, the, in this trial, um, the control arm is, is not really the standard of care that we have as of today. And whether this uh, regimen is um, as, as good or, uh, or better than uh, Cleopatra protocol, I, I don't think we can drive um, this conclusion from this um, trial bar in, in particular. So um, in conclusion, I, I think for the hormone positive, um, uh, HER2 positive um, dual anti-HER2 based chemotherapy, I would say it's remained the standard of care in majority of patients that we do see in our clinic. Uh, we used to give kind of an average of six to eight cycle of dusty and or even bacitaxel can be used as well. And then you can consider, um, uh, or um, this can be followed also by endocrine therapy maintenance uh, once um, uh, you stop chemotherapy. However, endocrine therapy based therapy might be also a reasonable alternative um, options for those who might not be candidate for chemotherapy or, or maybe even for a small volume disease. Uh, whether endocrine uh, or chemotherapy-based uh, dual anti 2 are equivalent, I don't think we know that for sure based on, on, the, on the trial that we have um, as, of, as of to date. With this, I think this is my last slide. I would like to thank you everyone and, and back to the, the co-chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdullah. It uh, cannot be more better than what it, uh, you present, actually. Uh, it was a very clear message. 